My mother is a California native who spent the majority of her adolescence and adulthood in the jungles of southern Mexico, where she met my father, whose family had been in those jungles for generations and generations. On first impressions, most people don't see the extent of my ethnicity. Pero para los hispanohablantes, soy Latino, soy Hispano, soy Mexicano, y específicamente, soy Chilango. Orale. I was born in Mexico City, where I spent most of my formative years. And like all kids coming of age, I had my quirks. I was allergic to almost every major food group. I had these incredibly flat feet, so flat that I had to wear these giant Forrest Gump style boots. All of my clothes were hand-me-downs from my brother, and all of my bad haircuts were from my well-intentioned mother. <laughs> we were dirt poor, but I was way too busy and way too happy to notice. I lived in these imaginary worlds of poor reception television. My mother held our bilingualism as a priority, so when I was not glued to El Barrio del Chavo, I was captivated by the neighborhood of Mr. Rogers. My five-year-old mantra was exactly what he said at the end of every episode. I am liked just the way I am. And I did. I liked me. I liked my weird. I took, I took his neighborhood and his world into mine and expanded it. I created new characters across dimensions and I would have conversations with my future and former self who would come and give me advice on these adventures we would go on and these missions that we would accomplish. And I would play these conversations out in my head and I would, in front of anyone who would notice. I liked who I was and I never thought that there was anything missing or strange or odd about me. Until I was eight years old, and for better or worse, my family decided to move to the United States. We moved to the only neighborhood we could afford, which was on the south side of Tucson, Arizona, a, a neighborhood, an area that was riddled with guns and drugs and violence. My parents sacrificed everything so that my brother and I could go to the best school possible. And to say that I was excited to go to an American school is an understatement. But I quickly learned that my weird would not be welcomed. This happened, and this realization happened, where most existential crises occur. Recess. <laughs> On that first day of third grade, recess began with my classmates playing out scenes from a movie I'd never seen called Star Wars. And one of them noticed my confusion and in what I can only describe was my first taste of verbal venom. He said, what, you don't know Star Wars? <laughs> Strike one, you don't have the knowledge. This quickly transitioned into pickup soccer games. Now, being from Mexico, most assumed that I would have some sort of soccer skills, but remember the flat feet, <laughs> Forrest Gump style shoes. Strike two, you don't have the abilities. During all of this, these kids in this predominantly Hispanic neighborhood were speaking Spanish, but the, the language varies so much region to region and my Spanish wasn't the same as theirs, so they were making fun of me and making fun of my Spanish and my English. And in this moment where I was going to stand up for myself, I looked at all of them and I raised my voice so that everyone could hear and I said, hey, I know my words aren't good now, but they're gonna get gooder. Nailed it. <laughs> Strike three. You don't have the words. I didn't fit in. I wasn't Mexican enough for the Mexicans and I wasn't white enough to be white. So I transformed. 
I transformed from this quirky, communicative kid to this recluse, terrified to be seen and heard. The only solace I had were these conversations that I would play out in my head. This life of silence continued until the end of my sophomore year of high school. At the end of my sophomore year of high school, a girl I had a crush on had invited me to have lunch with her and her friends. And we were discussing our summer plans and she was talking about how she was going to be joining the speech and debate team and how she was going to attend a speech and debate workshop that summer. And then she turned to me and said the words that literally changed the course of my life. She looked at me and said, hey, Eric, you should join the team and you should do this workshop with me and that way we can spend more time together. <laughs> blink, blink, hair toss. This was an impossible choice. <laughs> to spend time with a girl I had a crush on, I had to attend a speech and debate workshop. <laughs> I had to speak in front of people, willingly, sharing my thoughts and ideas. The mere thought of that left me breathless and there weren't even bats around then. <laughs> I mean, this was the craziest, most ridiculous idea I had ever heard, ever considered for myself. And I was considering it all just so that I could spend time with this girl. So I walked into the workshop a few weeks later. <laughs> this workshop was led by Miss Vicki Drennan, who I was told was sweet in the summer, but cutthroat in competition, which was fine because I was never going to get to that point. I managed to endure the first few days until she gave me an assignment of an interpretation event. An interpretation event is where you have a script and without props or costumes, using only postures, voices, and facial expressions, you act the script out. I remember taking my shaking script in front of the class, breathless again, and I started the first 15, minute, 15 seconds of my performance, and I heard this explosion of laughter, and it took me right back to those feelings of playground insecurity. Until I looked up and I realized they weren't laughing at me, I had made them laugh, which was something totally different. It gave me the confidence to join the team and try the competition field. Now this required a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with Mrs. Drennan, so I chose a script, I rehearsed it for weeks, I was nervous but excited to learn, to try things out. And I remember walking up in front of the classroom, out of breath again, and I started the first part of my first line when I heard the most terrifying stop. Everything about this is wrong. And I remember something totally involuntary happened. I took a step. I took a full step towards the door, knowing that I wanted to escape these feelings of insecurity. You know, those conversations that I played out, the ones between my future and former self, they never left me. They have always been my comfort. I use them to prepare for the future and to make sense of the past. And the only way that I can make sense of that moment is by imagining me today 
traveling back in time, confronting my 15-year-old self, stopping him, and I say, hey, don't go. I see you. Your fears are real, but they are not true. You're scared you don't have the knowledge because of what they said about Star Wars. But you and I both know the truth. The force is strong with you. <laughs> You're afraid you don't have the abilities because of some pickup soccer games. I have one word for you to look forward to and look forward to CrossFit. <laughs> Your body and abilities are meant for so much more. <laughs> and you're afraid you don't have the words. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes your words are wrong, they're embarrassing, they're hurtful. But that's not what's happening here. Here, you're gonna learn that you have a voice. Here, you are going to learn that the only person who has silenced that voice was you because you were too afraid of what might happen if you fail. Here, you're going to make words your life in the most unimaginable way. You are going to become an educator. And you're going to help people just like you who are afraid to be seen and heard. And you're going to give them a map to your words. And you're going to do it in, in los dos idiomas. Porque mientras nada se gana, nada se pierde. And I'm telling you, I know. I know you're scared. I know you're scared to show you're weird. I know you're scared of your words, but I promise you, I assure you, I guarantee you that your words, they get gooder and gooder and gooder. <laughs> I didn't go. I stayed for two and a half hours and worked on two paragraphs. That coaching session and that team gave me the tools for the first time to be seen and heard. Most people don't believe me when I tell them that this, all of this, speaking in front of people willingly, sharing my thoughts and ideas. This is still one of my greatest fears. But an even greater fear is forgetting what I learned so long ago, that I am liked just the way I am. An even greater fear is not being seen and heard. It is a fear that I will no longer lose to. It is a fear that no longer leaves me breathless. It is a fear that no longer leaves me speechless. Gracias and thank you.